we should sync up the audio. Yes. Let's try to do it at double, like at the same time. Hold it up. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Run. Ah, no. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And this is Andrew. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And today we are great, we are once again grace with Andrew's presence. I'm wearing the same thing I was wearing last week. Actually, that was a month ago, but thanks. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Amateur. Oh. Can't work with these people. Cut! No, there are no cuts. Oh, shit. We do it live. <laughs> um, no, today we want to talk about writing, and it was, it was cool to have you come out, because you wrote a novel. Actually, you wrote two. I've written two. Yeah. Yeah. I you are the only person... Uh, you're actually probably not the only person I know who's written a novel, but you're the only person who would come and podcast with us if written a novel. Uh, I'd be here. <laughs> no one's read it yet, but I wrote it. We, yeah, no, we, we, we are all like sort of writers of different flavors. Ryan wrote a thesis. No. I ostensibly wrote a thesis, but not really, although I tell people I did. I wrote three MRPs instead, major research papers, because it seemed easier than a th thesis. Just for posterity, it's not. <laughs> And anyone, anyone else out there has this idea to like, split things like, up? It's cool. It was things. great. I wouldn't. I wouldn't take it back. But easier is not the word I would use to describe it. I saw you go through that. Um, it, That's it, true. It was not friendly times. I mean, you were always friendly and cordial and everything. But you were, you were a different kind of gym when you were putting yourself through that. I only spent eighteen hours a day in my office. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, it was weird. You were pale. <laughs> oh, my academic pallor. It's, it's coming back now that I now that I once again. Well, you wrote a lot of shit. That's, I did. That's good news. Um. So, icebreaker, what piece of your writing are you most proud of? Um. I thought I was gonna have a, a hard time with this question, but the answer is really obvious. So I wrote a novel, mm -hmm. and I wrote another novel. Uh, but before I wrote those things, and I was really proud of writing a novel. That's not yeah. an easy thing to do. Um for a physics major. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't study this stuff, right? I spent most of my time avoiding writing in high school. Um, I wrote a short story before any of that stuff. Oh yeah, I read that. Um, and it was a 5,000 word short story and I submitted it uh, for publication in an anthology and the beneficiary of all the, ben of all the money, all the royalties from this anthology was a, a writer who um, suffered some hardship uh, almost died in hospital from toxic shock syndrome and a bunch of people were putting together an anthology um, the stories focused on the, the color orange she's got bright orange hair yep. um, and all the proceeds were going to go help pay her medical bills and I heard about this through some friends of friends and things like that and I wrote a short story um, about my brother-in-law uh, died tragically on my 35th birthday um, and his favorite color was orange um, so I kind of wrote a first person account of that day I had to deliver the news to his sister my wife um, about him passing um, she was in Dominican Republic with my daughter um, it was a rough day uh, but the whole ordeal was kind of humorous um, I mean, we have to think that if if you believe in the sort of thing that he is up in heaven or somewhere looking down on it, he would just be laughing his ass off at the absurdity <laughs> of some of these things that happen uh, and trying to get rally everyone and get everyone to the funeral and stuff like that. So I wrote this story um, and I submitted it for publication uh, and it was accepted and published in this book. Um, and now I've kind of got his, I guess the f first moments of after his death, kind of on record, um, and it, it was a really cathartic process. Um, it was a very emotional process. Um, it was a devastating story to write. I, I broke down several times throughout the course of writing it um, and editing it and um, editing it and editing it. <laughs> um, I'm most proud of it because um, it's all about the people I love. And they all read it. and. And loved it. Um, so I, I did the story justice. Um, you know, it's creative nonfiction, yeah. so it's it's not kind of a step-by-step count. Um, so I embellish here and there, and you know, I give everyone different names and stuff like that. 
Um, but all these people read this thing and and just were so touched and moved by it. Um, and that was a really good feeling. Um, it was kind of like the moment I realized I um, I could do it. Yes. Um, so yeah, that's the thing. And I'm going to plug it. It's uh, the book is called Orange Karen, A Tribute to a Warrior. Um, you can find it on Amazon. You can also find a link to it in our show notes. Uh, and my story is called Losing Vern. Um, read the story, you'll, you'll, you'll get why the title's that. Um, yeah, so that's the thing I'm most proud of. Nice. All the things I've read. Uh, I think you should have gone last because now I feel inadequate going next. Um, Everyone feels that way who comes after Andrew. And I, anything. I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you would, it's you, not true. <laughs> you would think that uh, I'd be most proud of uh, an essay that I won an award for in grad school. I remember that. Um, but that was, uh, I didn't even mean to win that. It was something that was submitted on my behalf. Um, but that's oddly enough not the thing I'm most proud of. The thing I'm most proud of is probably the thing that I don't really like and haven't read since I wrote it was my master's thesis. Fair enough. And I don't know if it is a an IKEA effect thing that because it was such a labor, I came to like it and value it so much. Uh, but it just, it was a capstone on, because I did undergrad back to back with grad school. Um, so it was a capstone on everything that I had learned over those, well, four years for undergrad and then three years procrastinating through grad school until I finally finished it. Um, it was probably the most uh, cogent argument that I made. Uh, it was, what was it, like a little under 100 pages, over 100 pages once you put the front and back matter to it. Um, Season two extra will be an hour long reading from <laughs> <laughs> Um But I, I felt like uh, I did a fairly good job of, I mean, chapter one for sure, chapter two and three get technical, but chapter one, I, f I felt like I did a good job of demystifying some of the ethics that I was talking about and bringing it down to a little bit more of an understandable level by, you know, using real world examples and sneaking sp uh, an allusion to Spider-Man into my, my uh, master's thesis. <laughs> the only thing I wish I would have did because my... My professor told me he would have probably paid me 50 bucks to do it as if I would have like snuck in a too long didn't read footnote somewhere. Um, but so yeah, I mean, I haven't read it. I, I've, I've barely looked at it. Um, I haven't read it and uh, I probably wouldn't be able to recreate it if I ever lost it in a fire. So that's how little I remember of it. But you should probably back it up online. Well, it is backed up on Dropbox. I'm talking about like if I were to lose it completely, would I be able to reconstruct it? Probably not. Um, but it's, I don't know, maybe because it was, it took uh, two years to write it. And I went through a lot of like stuff in my life during those two years. That it was just a, it was a good, solid, I have a tangible thing in my hand. It's not like a paper that you handed to your professor and usually it's electronically, right? Like it's bound, it's hard yeah. copy, it's hard cover. It's, you know, it was approved by three people that are significantly smarter than me and not just because they have letters at the end of the name. Copyright Ryan Huckle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, so it's, it was that kind of labor that makes it probably the thing I'm most proud of. And, but hopefully it's not the thing that that's not the only thing I'll achieve, you know. Like hopefully I'll go on to do other things. But Write another thesis, or have a child. I figured that would be a better achievement. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I, as a writing achievement, I feel like writing another thesis rates higher. Maybe, maybe. But like, I, I suppose if we're gonna look at the grander scheme of things, I mean, way to get on. Yeah, that's canter or something. That's yeah. not my proudest moment. That's the problem for me. That's the proudest thing. I'm proud, most proud of writing that. So uh, yeah. yeah. I, I couldn't write it easy. Yeah, Andrew's like, yeah, yeah, no, forget about my children. This, this is short yeah, story. Yeah, this this is what matters. Well, Jim, what, what's the uh, what's Mine, yours? I actually, I probably, the thinking about it, I probably could. I, I, I didn't write a thesis. I wrote in, uh, three MRPs. Um, something, probably, something paper. Major research papers. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they're, they're about the same. They, they work out being about the same length, but it's, it's, it's sort of triple the research. Uh, but I wanted to write about different stuff. And I'm probably thinking about it, probably could reproduce them if I had to. Which is weird. But they are, they are not what I'm most proud of. I'm most proud of a four-page paper that I turned in for a philosophy of quantum mechanics course when I was in fourth year. 
It was, uh, I, I got bored in second year of turning in ordinary papers. I definitely did turn in ordinary papers from Tom Elliott when I was super, like, crunch for time, or I'd been lazy, you know, here's a, here's a nine-page argument that examines all the things in this thing, and... Yeah, you knew the, the beats you had to hit. Yeah, you know, here's the, here's the stuff I have to wave at, and I, and I, I was never, I have a bunch of those I'm not really happy with, because they're just sort of, they don't, they don't really fully appreciate the nuance involved in, um, you know, the, the, the subject matter. Philosophy is all about nuance. 100% nuance. It is the making and keeping of fine distinctions. Mm -hmm. But, and so, so I got sort of bored, and I, especially with shorter papers, I started playing around, I, I wrote a couple papers that were, that were songs, my, my, my prof seemed kind of into it. And then quantum mechanics, we, we, it was designed for physics students, so there wasn't a lot of writing. So, uh, I, uh, you know, I had these tiny little four-page papers, which for a person, you know, in fourth year, when you've been writing 12 and 20 page papers, it's not a big deal. So I wrote this paper on quantum Bayesianism, the theory of quantum Bayesianism. It's actually, it's posted on the blog, so I can include links to it uh, in the show notes. If you want to go and read, it's only four pages, and it's entirely in Susian rhyme. Nice. The, the whole thing is in rhyming couplets. <laughs> I gotta read it. It's a good time. Um, and I, like, I put it up on the blog uh, while I was still in, in, in grad school. Uh, it was, it was like, I used it as sort of a, a couple of my poetry papers are up. You can find them in the poetry section uh, in, our, in our posting notes. And they're, you know, they're just, I use them as sort of filler posts because they seemed fun and they were, and I wanted to share them. And the quantum Bayesianism is, is, is at that point, there, was, there had only been one, one paper written about it by Chris Fuchs, who works at the Perimeter Institute, which is in town. One day, during grad school, I was at the grad house, and I was often at the grad house at the university, which is where grad students go to drink and eat food, and this guy comes up to me, because I saw a couple of my profs there, and I was like, hey guys, and this guy comes up to me, he shakes my hand, he's like, you're the guy! Now, I preface this by, by noting that very rarely in my life, am I the guy? Very rarely. <laughs> the point in which I become the guy is very special, but it is beyond seldom. And I am shaking his hand and trying to figure out who he is. <laughs> And why you are the and, guy. And why I am the guy. I assumed that he was heinously drunk. He was not. It was Chris Fuchs, the author of that paper. And he had been Googling quantum Bayesianism to see what other people were writing about it. And he had stumbled upon this very blog and that very post about, with my poem, about quantum Bayesianism, and he had read it, and he liked it very much, because I had based it on his paper, and I cited his paper, and it was, it was, you know, it was, it was a neat thing about his, about his work, and he really liked it, and he had, he had sent it to a bunch of people, and it was cool, it got a bunch of traffic, but the thing that matters most to me, I spent, I, I still spend, spend my life, but I mean, I, I spent an entire course, previous to that, I had spent an entire lifetime, of course, I would spend an entire year basically locked in an office with a quantum physicist. Uh, Jesse Wright, my office mate, does philosophy of quantum mechanics. And uh, he is, he's at uh, Western now, and he is bloody brilliant. And I still did not... I, I, I would I'd never make a claim that I remotely understand quantum mechanics. I, I know more about it than I did, but that doesn't say much. But at no point... Did he, in, in, his, in his praise and criticism of my poem, did he be like, you got my theory wrong? I sufficiently understood his theory that I managed to write a poem about it. And that makes me feel really good, because I went through a lot of that course being like, 
I have no idea how this works. I recall coming to my prof one day and being like, so, I haven't written anything yet. She went, yeah, I noticed that. I said, um, usually what I do in a philosophy course when I, everything's super weird, is I keep reading the books until it stops being weird. And then I write something about it. But I keep reading the books, and it hasn't stopped being weird. <laughs> welcome and to we're halfway mechanics. through the story. And that's exactly what she said. Yeah. She's like, welcome to quantum mechanics. You might want to write something. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but That is truly something to be proud of, though. It was, it was really cool. And for a moment, I was the guy. I was the guy. Never again. One time. But that's a story for a different day. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess the question isn't what do you, what, what did you write then, but what do you write now? Andrew, I know you, you enjoy crime. I enjoy like a good thriller. Um, I like, uh, I like, I really like killing people. Thanks, thanks. For that. <laughs> thanks for looking the camera dead, like square in the lens, I mean, just like I really like killing people. That's <laughs> that's gonna be. On the news someday, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, so I like, I, I really like writing fiction. I, um, making shit up is, is just so much fun. <laughs> it really is. And, like, I have a friend of mine who, um, so the, the part two of the novel that I wrote, um, it kind of gets into this, like, biomedical sort of stuff. And a friend of mine, um, actually has a, a, a PhD in biochemistry. Um, he, 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 he researches and makes cancer drugs. Cool. Cancer fighting drugs for, <laughs> like, for a living, right? Awesome. That's what he does. This is kind of like part of my thing. And I wrote a whole bunch of stuff in the, of the second book. I haven't finished it, but I've got a whole bunch of stuff kind of written down and jotted down. It's all bullshit. It's just completely made up. Um, and he read it, and he was just like, this is not going to do. And I'm like, but that's the beauty of it. Because it doesn't have to be... It doesn't have to be... Right, in any sense. It just needs to be believable to people who don't know any different. And most people don't know shit about cancer drugs. Robert Sawyer hear you that. He would crucify you if you admitted that you're writing about something that doesn't matter if it's true or not. It doesn't. It just needs to... Like, because it's... Like, I'm not... Writing like an account I, of something. I would this not fear not the fiction. author of Flash Forward. No, I'm not yeah. saying that we should fear Robert Sawyer. I don't like, like the guy particularly. But. I just need people to read it and be able to suspend disbelief. Yeah. And for a little bit of time, it's just got to be believable enough. No. Right? And the, the novel I did write, it's got a lot of techno hacker stuff in it. And I consulted with some computer hackers on the subject, and I myself dabbled in another lifetime in computer geekery. Are you in fact a lead hacksor? No. Okay. Um, I was interested in it. I kind of read a bit of things, I did a few things, and, but the book is just, it's just bullshit because most people aren't those people. Mm -hmm. And most people, people are going to read it, they're going to just be like, oh, well, shit, sounds, sounds legit. Also, and they're going to keep reading. Also, hacking, uh, like real Real life hacking is boring. What, it's not 90s hacking? <laughs> on the oh, keyboard? No, sometimes it is that on the keyboard, but the things that are happening on the screen are considerably less yeah. interesting than they were yeah. in there's, hackers. So there's a blog that, uh, just as a side note, there's a blog uh, or a Tumblr where somebody takes scenes out of movies and looks at the screen of whatever code is going on and actually analyzes it. Yes. So, what's what's oh, going yes. on? I remember, uh, it, is it true? Or what is it actually representing? As there's, a, there's a whole bunch of people in like CSI, I think, who are just looking at CSS code for the yeah. whole thing. Or just a page of Perl. Yeah. Anyway, you can find the link to that Tumblr uh, in the show notes and check it out because it's hilarious. Yeah. Especially yeah. if you know anything about computers. So I like writing yeah. stuff like that. I mean, I, I tried my hand at some like, creative nonfiction. It was all right, but it's exhausting. Yeah. Um, like mentally draining to, to have to get facts straight and stuff like that. Like, uh, who's got time to check that? Um, <laughs> honestly, I, just, I like killing people. Um, <laughs> I I gonna be on the news. <laughs> no, 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 I wanted us to get is, on the news. It's one of those things where I I went on a spree. I I, I built up to it. I never offed someone in anything I've written. So I blog. Um, 
I'm ready to just short stories. Do you down. kill a lot of people on your blog? Nope. Potatochipmath.com? No, potatochipmath.com. Um, I was leading up to it in the in the in the book. I was like, oh my god, I gotta I gotta kill somebody. So I kind of I, I spent a lot of time just like thinking about it. I'm like, okay, how's this gonna work? Because I gotta get the details right. Um, you know, it's gotta be fabulous. I can't just have someone die. That's boring, right? Um, I wouldn't know. I've never killed anybody. So I, I worked yeah, up yeah, to it, and, I, and then not I, murderers. I started murderers. writing this scene. And, and it just started going, and, and I did it, and I got this big rush, and I was like, oh my god, I totally just killed this guy. So then I kept writing, and I was like, shit, someone else is going. Like that, I just picked random character in my book, I just started killing people. By the end of the chapter, six people murdered. Just, there's more blood on the page than any other, any other word, just every other adjective is something to do with killing. Um, so you're a disciple of, like, George R.R. R. Martin. You know, it was just this rush. I was like, oh my god, this is so great. And I started, like, just writing in ways I'd like to kill people. Like, I'd never kill someone. I, like, I couldn't physically ever do that. But there was this Westboro Baptist Church person. I was like, imagine them. How would that go down? And I killed a character in my book. Yep, gonna be on the news. <laughs> Andrew, this is not the podcast where we confess the crimes that we've committed. I haven't committed any crimes. I've written a That's lot exactly what some of us committed a bunch of crimes to say. <laughs> anyway, um, eight or ten chapters later, I realized I killed half the people I needed to finish the story, and I was like, ah, crap. Did you just so mysteriously I, unkill them? Yeah, I, I have to go back and unkill them so that I can finish the damn thing. But <laughs> so um, did you just remove the text, or did you create a whole like other subplot in terms of how they came back to life? No, no, no. It's not that. I, I don't write uh, fantasy or, um, type genre stuff. Just it's all kind of rooted in B BS and in real matter. physics <laughs> and, and real science. Um, so people don't come back to life and, I, and some people don't time travel and things things like that in my books. Um, which is fine. I don't, I don't like to write that stuff. What do I write? I write the stuff that's completely made. I, I would argue, as somebody, who, as somebody who does write a lot of fantasy, I write a lot of stuff for D&D, &D, I, 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 I spend a lot of time sort of thinking symbolically and, and, and about mythologies, partly because it is, it is an interpretation of the way that I relate to the world itself, but that it is, it is even more made up. I mean, imagine your universe in, in which your characters apparently live in a kill-or-be-killed battle royale <laughs> reality. I mean, no matter how how weird it seems, it's never going to involve ancient aristocrats from extra-dimensional winter kingdoms sneering at the fact that mortals have evolved from monkeys while they were simply woven from the fabric of reality. Because that shit's weird. That is... See, and that that's the thing. I have certain compulsions, which if you saw previous podcasts... I you can find the link over Huck's face. Um, I need certain things to be true. Mm -hmm. So I need some reality to, to base all my stuff on. Um, I, I don't understand fantasy um, as a genre. It's just not something that I've ever gravitated toward or explored in any mm -hmm. in any way so it's just not something that my mind Ironically, is capable of Andrew's gift for being on our podcast it was a fantasy book so I'm intrigued to see how that goes it's true and I, and I mean I'll read anything someone hands me and said you should read this and I'll, I'll no certain people will hand me things and say you should read this and I'll believe them and I'll read it <laughs> you're one of those people so I'll read that book um, I hate to see what happens if you give them a copy of Plato or something <laughs> No, but, but I mean, the, the thing with fantasy, like, like, the thing with fantasy, a lot of the time, yeah, is no sort of you just, no, well, you do make rules, like, you spend a lot of time making rules, that's why some, well, fantasy is often symbolic. You're not given rules. Like, no, you, you sort of, you set, you, you set a bunch of rules, and you're like, okay, these are the rules, and you write, you write a story in those rules. I mean, sci-fi is the same way, when you, when you, when you get into hard sci-fi, like, future history and stuff like that, they're like, okay, let's change the rules a little bit. What happens when we change those rules? Mm -hmm. I mean, you get that in, in, in fiction, too. I mean, Lord of the Flies, Heart of Darkness. They're classic novels that involve uh, Huckleberry Finn, that, that involve altering or changing the, the rules. Not necessarily yeah. the rules of reality, but the rules of society, the rules of civilization. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's all... It's, 
I, I don't want to say that writing is all about the rules, but fantasy is just as much about the rules as it is as as fiction. I like the idea that you can make up your rules, like you get to set those terms as yeah. as the writer. Um, I don't think of myself as a terribly creative person. Um, I don't think I can. Unless make you're up. thinking of ways to kill people. Well, I can be, but I mean, I, I I'm bad at making up rules. I'm great at taking existing rules and working with them I'm, and I, I work that way in my whole life I've worked that way I'm not the guy who comes up with the idea I'm the guy who helps shape it and massage it so I could probably write fan fiction for fantasy stuff nice fan, <laughs> uh, no, fan, fan fiction um, good time. now that I think about it maybe I'll maybe I'll try that that would be fun you have been notoriously silent Ryan um, I don't really have a lot of interesting things to say in terms of what I write. Um, I've written a lot of academic stuff. Uh, in terms of fiction... You a lot of minutes. Well, I read a lot of minutes. <laughs> that is, minutes. That is, that is <laughs> terribly non-fiction. Um, no, uh, in terms of writing fiction, I haven't written any kind of uh, meaningful fiction since I was a teenager. Because I did a, a little bit of fan fiction. Mm-hmm. Um... And then, but now it's usually just, you know, I'll come up with an idea or a concept and kind of muse about it. Like, what kind of story would I tell if I were to try to convey this concept? Um, you know, how would I narrate this story? But I, it never makes it into any kind of either tangible physical space or digital space. I never write it. It's just yeah. usually kind of like muse about, you know, like what if, what if we were to take this idea and run with it? Um, so a lot of it's nonfiction, minutes, academics. Um, in the last three years, I've written a fair number of speeches. I usually give about four speeches a year, which I know doesn't sound like a lot. Those could be fun. Those are fun. Because be I've gotten, I, I, uh, because I've practiced and, and written speeches over the last three years, um, I've gotten good at a particular kind of speech. So now we're at the point where we're trying to challenge ourselves to do other kinds of speeches. Um, so I recently gave a... If I were to spin Teddy Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, that old style of speaking, into kind of like creating an impetus for action towards fitness, you know, how would I write it? So I wrote a speech and delivered it to some friends. And it went over really well, actually. So um, the speeches, uh, I think there was one other thing. Uh, I don't remember. It's probably not important. But uh, so I don't really, I don't really get into interesting it's just uh, a lot of reports. You know, that's the mostly what I do now is reports. As always, Ryan is the matter-of-fact responsible guy. <laughs> and I am the weird guy. Yeah. What am I? You're somewhere in the middle. You're, you, you. I think, I we've agreed, are... He's literally somewhere in the middle. <laughs> also oh. that. Oh. You're not the joke guy. I'm sorry to all the people who are listening <laughs> who, to the podcast to hear and, that. Not, and not seeing it, but Andrew is sitting between... Jim and I, so he's literally somewhere between the two of us. Oh my. But, uh, no, yeah, I believe that we have established that you are the murderer. I am the murderer. I am. Andrew on the podcast with the candlestick. Be careful. <laughs> Mr. Body. Be careful what you say around me, because if I don't like it, I'll kill you in one of my Wait bars. a second, be careful what you're saying, <laughs> because you're in the s- age of the internet, this is not going away. But that's the truth, right? He'll, kill you, a, no, a, no, he'll kill you in one of your books. Books. There's this thing that you can see on, on Facebook, one of those like blunt cards or e cards or whatever, and it is if if that if they didn't want you to say that about them, they should have behaved better, or something to that effect, right? And that's yeah. true, right? If you don't want me to write about you, don't do things that are stupid enough or dumb enough or insane enough for me to want to write about. Fair enough. I guess that is one thing that inspired that could inspire you, right? Like most of my fantasy stuff is is. Either drawn out of direct need for it because I run a lot of D and D games, or or my obsession with symbols and their interaction and their standing in for things. I've often wondered what sparks you to put stuff out there, like to create, especially with like your blog posts and, and other blog posts are things that I usually have to write. Like like it's it's lately. I mean, um. I, Two weeks ago, we had a blog post on winter and its relation to powerlessness and things like that. Uh, before that, I talked about I have this weird fascination with bro culture that I don't I don't think it's healthy or good, but it fascinates me in a really really sort of weird way. 
you know, or lately I've, I've committed to talking about more about social justice issues because the notion that I would be quiet on these issues has become intolerable. That, that, like, by being quiet, I am, I am contributing to conditions. Mm. Like, you know, it's, it's sort of that conspiracy of silence problem. And, but, but I mean, that's, that's all sort of a matter of, like, like, I don't want to say it's a matter of fact stuff, but it's just it's sort of, here's a thing I'm thinking about, let's extend that as much as we can, and it turn it into a thing. So what's your inspiration? Like, what's your muse do? I don't, I don't, day. I don't understand muses. I don't, I, 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 we're part of, Andrew and I are part of a writer group, and, and we, we talk about muses sometimes, but it's not a thing I understand. The way I think about it is, and a friend of mine once told me that we, we had this weird conversation wherein I was writing, I, I, I offered to write slash fiction about her husband, jokingly, but I mean, it would, he's a handsome guy. But uh, she's like, you really enjoy, you know, weird conversations. I'm like, I, I don't. I'm weird all the time. Like these, these bits of writing and, and weird videos and stuff like this is my this is my conduit for inviting people in to this thing that I swim in and hopefully cool things will happen. I don't even, I don't even want to say hopefully they learn something because that implies that I have necessarily something to teach but hopefully something cool happens and sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't but I mean and yeah my fantasy work is is directly related to that because it's it, it envisions everything as symbolic and this is okay what happens when symbols interact whether those symbols are warriors and dragons and what dragons mean and you know, things like that and dragons represent things like things that are old and powerful and ancient and hidden and what does that mean how does it collide with other symbols and other tropes and i just sort of rub them up against each other and uh things come out it's, it's highly uncomplicated and yet really super weird. That's interesting. But I like at the same time writing nonfiction, like writing minutes. I I have written minutes and I am abysmal at it. Oh, I hate it. Again, <laughs> a lot of my job is doing just that, documenting. I can, I, I love writing documentation. Mm. No, technical just writing, conversations, and decisions. Oh, yeah. and no, like I do that. a lot of technical. Writing. Action item. Oh. I I'd like to think I'm pretty good at what whenever whenever I pump out as a minute or a set of minutes i'm actually pretty good at it ryan is an exceptional minute taker if seriously if you are looking for a guy to take minutes for your committee every committee that i have been on with you you have always taken the minutes and everyone always adores your minutes to the point you where have, like, if you're not there they're at a loss if you're handwriting them is your writing all like round and curly like do you have girl writing i have girl writing because mm. i find that those people usually take great minutes I don't, yeah, if nothing else, it's readable. No, well, no, no, no. My my minutes are good because um, I know that um, I usually get caught up in the conversation and I sometimes forget to write down what's important. Or in the moment, I have a hard time recognizing what's important because I don't believe in taking the bare bone minutes in terms of like the agenda was approved, the minutes were approved, motion to do this, like just capturing the actions of it. I like to capture details. So... Uh, I usually get permission from the chair, whoever, and I will uh, tape the, uh, an audio version. Season of it. two extra. Ryan wraps a set of his minutes <laughs> while I beatbox. <laughs> so I, I'll record it. Take my, I'll handwrite my my minutes to provide the scaffolding, but then I'll also write notes to myself of like really interesting conversation. Go back and capture the details there, and then you don't have to you don't have to write the transcript of what's going on, but you have to capture the the flow of the ideas so that. The end motion makes sense. The idea is, uh, in ten years' time, when I'm not around, hopefully taking the minutes still, somebody goes to reconstruct what was going on, and they can follow what mm. was said in these meetings. And it holds people accountable, but it also gives them enough information that they might yeah. not have otherwise had. I have, I have read minutes from uh, 50 years ago for, for, for boards, and it is interesting and simultaneously interesting and depressing. Um, for, for lots of reasons, partly because, I mean, some boards, you, you can look at it and you'll be like, oh, well, it's 50 years later and this is still an issue. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's got, had an open action for 
long what time. Have, what have we really done? <laughs> He's still chair of the committee. Oh, well, I guess we just have to say we're late with that, and uh, what do we do next week? Speaking of late, our podcast is running over time. Oh, I mean, we've talked, about, we've talked about writing minutes, we've talked about writing fiction, we've talked about writing fantasy. Uh, I want to, as always, we are hungry for comments, and I want to see what you're writing. Leave them in the comments, and I will read them, and I will probably write funny things in response to them. I write a blog, which often writes about writing. It's true. Andrew does true. write a blog. Andrew, what is your blog? My blog is potatochipmath.com. You can find it in the show notes. Yeah. <laughs> but not over Huck Space. Anyway, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I'm Andrew. And we're signing off. Stay awesome. The rule for you is anything. I will edit this podcast. We usually don't edit them at all, so don't worry about it. But I'll edit the podcast in a way that looks, makes you look the most awesome. That is my general rule for editing. Uh, except for except for, for Huck. Yeah. Everything cool Huck does, I cut. Yeah. And every... every Everything stage. Smarty says, I put it in my own mouth. Yeah. Spend hours just like doing a voiceover and inserting my head in exactly the right spot so it all sounds like it's going.